considering the recent changes. Now I call upon Mr. Vedant Radhakrishnan to escort session chairman C.S. Sachin Kumar B.P. and student speaker Ms. Shamita C. Big round of applause. And welcome with the flower bouquet. Now I request Vedan to take over. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. It is an immense pleasure to introduce CA Sachin Kumar BP. He is a fellow member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India and is currently a chief strategic partner of Messrs Manohar Chaudhary and Associates Chartered Accountants as well as a non-executive director of a London-based multinational company. Being an alumnus of the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, as well as a graduate from Kuwempu University, he has a wide range of experience in advising leading Indian and multinational corporations on various domestic and international tax matters. He has represented large corporates and government undertakings before the Income Tax Department and Appellate Authorities in India. He was the chairman of the Taxation Committee of the Karnataka State Chartered Accountants Association during the year 2003 to 2004. He has presented various papers relating to direct taxes, analytics, and technology in seminars organized by the ICAI and other forums in India and abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our highly distinguished session chairman, CA Sachin Kumar VP. Introducing our first student speaker, Mr. Akshay S. Chipadi. Akshay is currently a CA final student and is pursuing his articleship at JAA and Associates Bengaluru. Possessing strong leadership, technological, and communication skills, Akshay has been successful at various competitions, including the Innovaves Commerce Fest conducted by National Public School Indranagar. Akshay's goal is to one day be among one of the most renowned experts in the industry. Please put your hands together for our first student speaker, Mr. Akshay S. Chipadi. <laughs> Introducing our next student speaker, Ms. Shamita C. Harli. Shamita is currently pursuing her articleship in Messrs. NSVM and Associates, Bengaluru. With a proven ability to complete tasks, with dedication and having the curiosity to explore new areas for learning, Shamita has been successful at various competitions, which includes winning the first prize at the International Elocution Competition conducted by the CBSC at New Delhi. Being experienced at various leadership roles during her academic and college days, Shamita aspires to be an efficient chartered accountant while also pursuing her hobby of public speaking. Please welcome our next student speaker, Ms. Shamita C. Halli. I now request the session chairman, C.A. Sachin Kumar B.P., to take charge of the session. Thank you so much, uh, Bangalore branch of uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, for inviting me to be here this fine afternoon to be amidst all of you, to share some of my thoughts and experiences and just listen to young speakers out here, their views on this capital gains. Uh, before we venture into even uh, listening to what they have to say, I was quite uh, uh, intrigued when uh, this uh, program was announced and uh, when I was asking my st students how many of them would like to attend, how many would like to present papers, I'm sorry. Uh, while all of them were willing to attend, but then uh, when we asked how many of them would like to present papers, not many uh, hands were raised. I'm sure same is the question uh, in many other firms. 
just would like to tell you what is the importance of uh, communication for you and I as a chartered accountants. We are good at no doubt when it comes to technical skills, absolutely. There is no unparalleled uh, profession that we have which can uh, compete with us as far as technical competency is concerned. But when it comes to communication, I think we have to take that extra step. Just let's understand hypothetically for a minute. Let's say, hypothetically, all of us have cleared with same rank, let us say. And our background, family background, also happens to be more or less same. Let us say, Microsoft has come to Bangalore, here in Ambedkar Bhavan, they want to hire one CEO, and they have come here. Considering that all of you have cleared your CA with more or less same uh, rank and family background being the same, whom do you think Microsoft would select? Because all of your grades are same, family background is same, whom do you think they would hire? Don't you think, guys, they would hire a person who can communicate well? Given everything equal, communication is the only thing that makes a distinction and it will see to what extent you can go. One. And second, also it is important, friends, we are in a very, very significant, the stage of life where you are is quite significant for you. Because so far, when you are there in first standard, you are there amongst people who are first standard. When you are there in 10th standard, you had friends with whom you related who are 10th standard, who are 15 years of age. Similarly, when you came to CA, you related with friends who are of that age. But once you clear your chart accountancy, you will be pushed, pushed into a world where you may have to relate with people who are very, very senior to you. There could be possibility that you may have to relate with the people who are very junior to you. How is that you are going to lead them? You will be able to lead them only if you are good at communications. In fact, while the subject is on capital gains, I thought I will make this remark to begin with, because whenever there is a chance you get, raise your hands to communicate. It will not only strengthen your communication, but also what you know. What you know is one aspect of the matter. What you know when you say, you will be learning it for the second time. And what you know, what you say, you will be hearing it for the third time. And that is the third way of learning. Friends, with this brief remark, let me now move on to the technical session. Let's hear them out what these young, young students they have to say. One, one, I must acknowledge their effort at this point of time, when they were preparing for their papers, they came with the initial cut of their presentation, and I made some uh, comments about it. I just wanted to test their uh, interest in the subject and interest their commitment to this. I said by tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, I think 5 o'clock you guys met, right, on that day? And uh, the challenge was, were quite heavy, and I said tomorrow before 8 o'clock, I must see your, uh, I must see your uh, PPTs. Believe me, friends, I'm getting their PPT morning at 2.30. Don't you think it calls for applause? A person, a person who is committed and who they have been able to do it throughout night, I think they really deserve a good round of applause, as well as friends, this subject of capital gains, the basic tenet of income tax, friends, all of you agree, is that it says all revenue receipts are subject to tax unless they are exempt, unless they are specifically exempt. All revenue receipts are taxable unless they are specifically exempt. And all capital receipts are exempt unless they are specifically taxed. This is the basic tenet of taxation. And when we say that all capital receipts are exempt unless they are specifically taxed, here is the capital gains, which is a capital receipt. Because it is made subject to tax, you know, it is subject to tax. 
otherwise it would not have been right having said that the second tenet of the taxation is always it is the real income that is subject to tax notional income is not subject to tax right but as the law is evolving as newer ways of doing doing transactions is emerging you know somewhere we find are we taxing the capital gains are we taxing the real gains there is a doubt that arises therefore they have chosen this topic today so let's see what these young uh, paper writers have to say and let's listen to them and let's see what they have to tell us friends now i think uh, you are speaking first come good afternoon to the dignitaries present on the stage and off the stage and uh, my dear friends good afternoon can i hear a response please i am akshay chipadi and uh, i am from namo bengaluru <laughs> so why are we here today we are here to discuss about the topic whether capital gains are real gains considering the recent changes let's get into it how i will be taking you through the presentation is i'll be giving you an introduction i'll be giving you i'll be talking to you about the recent changes that have happened i will be talking about one particular topic imaginary gain versus real gain and then i will be giving you the concluding statement so let's get into it introduction so what is capital gain in layman language capital gain is a gain that is that one makes by selling an asset at a premium dictionary meaning a gain is a increase in wealth or resources but we are all ca students so the income tax definition applies to us that is our bible so say it with me what is a gain a gain is a gain that a capital gain is a gain that arises from the transfer of a capital asset so what is a gain what is a transfer and what is a what is a capital asset is given by the income tax so if you see this one particular yellow color uh, oval circle imagine that it is a piece of land now that land you have purchased for 50 crores suppose over the over a period of time it becomes 150 crores so the result in 100 crores is your capital gain now moving forward that is the introduction i'd like to give you an interesting fact india is the seventh largest economy in the world sitting in between france and italy and even though the gdp fell down by fell down to 5.7% it is still one of the fast growing economies in the world only second to china so can we have a big round of applause for that because all of that late night working what we did is part of this part of this economy so why have why have told you this is not because it's an interesting fact because it outlines how much our economy is growing and why we need changes in the economy so there are five changes that i would like to talk to you about two of which will be dealt with my dealt by my co-speaker shamita in depth so number 1 holding period number 2 conversion of private companies to llp number 3 transaction of rupee denominated bonds by non residents number 4 the famous ltcg tax number 5 stamp duty valuation moving in holding period so holding period is the number of days that the asset is held before it is sold now the holding period depends on whether it's a financial asset or a non financial asset but all that apart the recent change that has happened in this particular area is that if you take immovable property the the holding period for immovable property to be considered as a long term asset was was 36 months so that was reduced to 24 months in the recent budget and therefore the if you hold an asset for 36 if you hold an asset for 24 months and then sell it that particular gain or loss will be considered as a long term capital gain or loss so why is this important you must understand that the long term capital gain if it again when it becomes long term capital gain 
can be invested into bonds or another immobile property to become exempt. So you don't need to pay tax on that. That is important. And the second point is that this immobile property will promote this this move will improve the real estate economy real estate industry now because of the demonetization and the gst rollout that industry had seen a bit of a slowdown in growth now because of this holding period uh, change it will it will promote the real estate investment C po coming to point number 2 conversion of private limited into llp now you would know a concept of slump sale where a lump sum consideration is given for a bag of assets and liabilities as a whole. Now if the consideration given is more than the, more than the value of the assets and liabilities as a whole, now there is a capital gain involved in that. If suppose this company were to become an LLP and this capital gain conversion this, uh, this conversion would, would not be treated as a transfer. Why is this so? Because now, as you, as you know, as you might know, that uh, India has jumped 30 points to go into the top 100 club of doing ease of, uh, of the world ease of, uh, world ease of uh, doing business index. So therefore, this, this move will promote that uh, particular initiative where it's, it's easier to do business in India now. There are, there are conditions for this uh, exemption, for this uh, conversion to become, not to be subject to tax. You will have to have all assets and liabilities in the partnership to be part of the company. And then the shareholding pattern should be the same in profit share, as the profit sharing ratio in the LLP. And also that the, comp the private limited company should not have a turnover of 60 lakhs in the past three years. So this move will help, as I said, this move will help do, uh, increase the initiative of... Uh, I'm so sorry. This move will help with the ease of doing business index in India. Moving forward, the third one, rupee, transfer of rupee-denominated bonds by a non-resident. Now, a rupee-denominated rupee bonds, as the name says, is a bond, is a debt security of an Indian company which is issued to an which is issued to, out, to offshore uh, entities. Now, these bonds are called masala bonds because they are famous, because they are from India, it brings out the taste of uh, India and it also helps uh, making, the, making these bonds famous because it is associated with the word masala. Now, uh, these bonds, if they are transacted by non-residents outside India, they will, not, they will also not be deemed as a transfer. So therefore, it will not be subject to tax. What, what does this do? What, how does this help us? Now, from an, invest, from an investor's point of view, this particular uh, move will help me, to, uh, help me with my tax liability, but also it brings in for, valuable foreign exchange to our economy. So that is a good thing about this. Point number four is the LTCG tax, which will be dealt by my co-speaker. This also this is this states that uh, if your uh, long-term capital gain uh, is above rupees one lakh, now it will be subject to tax. And stamp duty valuation. Suppose you sold a property and the stamp duty valuation of the same is is more than the consideration that you have received. Can anybody tell me what happens in this case? Sorry. The stamp duty valuation will be considered as the, as the full value of consideration. Therefore, even if you receive 100 rupees, but the stamp, de stamp duty valuation is 150, even though you have not received the money, you will have to pay tax on rupees 150. I would like to bring that point into consideration. And also, also the buyer will be taxed that differential amount as his income from other sources. I would like to invite that point. Point number three, moving on, this is an interesting topic whether what, what consists of capital gain that is real gain, ca capital appreciation which is real gain, and what is inflation which is an imaginary gain. So if you look at this picture, this is basically a pictorial representation of inflation. So you can see credit boom, there's higher wage cost, increased energy bills, failing, falling en exchange rates. So what happens in an inflationary economy where there is a lot of liquidity and there will be more 
higher income for everybody. Now, leave all this. Take an example of Flipkart big billion day sale. Now, they have given very good, very good interest rates, 0% interest, zero down payment, and the products are cheap. Everybody goes and buys. And so if you don't buy, a person next to you will buy. So for him, he will increase the price anyway. This, this what this does is it weakens the rupee. It, the, buy, the purchasing power of the person decreases, and therefore it weakens the rupee. That, ha that is what happens in an inflationary game. Now, if, now, that is not real gain, just because, the other, just because everybody has higher income and the, the costs are also increasing. So it's not real. But what is real is, imagine you have invested 10,000 rupees into an unlisted company. This unlisted company, is, you have, you've invested into this because you think they are going to develop, they have good internal controls, and they have good processes, and they're in a good industry. And this, suppose two years later, this company is actually doing well. It's, it's grown in terms of market share, it's grown in, uh, in terms of um, sales, all that. And there's low turnover of employees, all of that. So this company has actually done well. Compared to an inflationary position, an inflationary uh, point of view, this, this company has grown from 10,000 rupees of to, say, 50,000 rupees valuation. So this 40,000 is actual gain. It's not imaginary gain. So, which do you think should be taxed? Whether inflationary gain should be taxed or this capital appreciation to be taxed? Inflationary gain or capital, gain, capital appreciation? Capital appreciation should be taxed. So, how is this dealt with? There is, uh, I'll give you a hint. Indexation. So, this, this concept, this, this is dealt with the mechanism of indexation. Now, we all know that 100 rupees today, ha to yesterday is not 100 rupees today. So what, what the income tax allows you to do is, it will allow you a deduction of not 100 rupees, but the index cost of acquisition. Now if 100 rupees was today value, the value of 100 rupees yesterday is today 150, they will not allow you a deduction of 100, they will allow you a, the deduction of 150. So what this does is, it splits the inflationary gain and capital appreciation and they will not be subject they will not be taxing inflationary gain they will only be taxing capital appreciation so that is the point that i would like to make i have told you the recent changes i have told you about capital gain that is capital appreciation that is imaginary gain and real gain so i would like to deliver my, my conclude, conclusion by giving a quote as long as, thinki as long as thinking is one of the things no one has, no one has ever been able to tax. So as long as people, people can think there will be new ways of making income, there will be new laws to keep that in check. So therefore, all the amendments that have come into place is either to the benefit of the taxpayer or it is the benefit of the economy as a whole. Thank you. Romney, can you all hear me? Yeah, you can. <laughs> Mitt Romney, a famous American businessman and politician once said, there are many people who think we should have zero tax on capital gains, interest and dividends. But does it make you realize that it means that people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett would pay no income tax at all? Okay. I want you all to imagine yourselves to be investors. Just sit back, and relax, all your investments are earning returns just as you expected. Or at least that's what you think. But wait, you know those shares you invested in last year, do you know if you have to pay long term capital gains tax if you sell them now? Oh and what about the property you are planning to purchase? Have you compared the agreement price with the stamp duty value? And not to forget, you've invested some capital gains amounts in specified bonds, thinking it is exempt under Section 54EC. 
Are you sure it is exempt even now? I am sure all of you all agree with me when I say that capital gains is a tax that most of the investors come across when they sell their properties or shares. It's a tax that directly affects the investment decisions of every investor. But I think that due to the recent amendments brought about in the law, the investors are confused whether these changes are a real gain to them. Good evening everybody, this is Shamita and the topic that I will be presenting today, like you all know, is whether capital gains is a real gain considering the recent changes. In my session, thank you, in my session, I will be taking you through four major amendments brought in the Union Budget 2018. So I will be first talking about the long-term capital gains tax on sale of listed shares and securities, and then about the deemed income arising on sale or purchase of immovable property. Later I'll be discussing about the amendments in Section 54EC, and finally about the concessions given for the International Financial Services Center, that is the IFSE. And my co-speaker, Mr. Akshay, has already briefed you about the first two amendments. But I will be taking you more into detail by giving you a few examples so that you can clearly bifurcate what is the difference between the pre-budget and the post-budget scenario. Let's move into the first one. The finance minister, Mr. Arun Jaitley, introduced the much talked about long-term capital gains tax on sale of listed shares and securities for gains over rupees 1 lakh. So he introduced section 112A and withdrew section 1038 by stating that all the long-term capital gains tax on sale of listed shares and securities would be taxed at the rate of 10% without indexation benefit. However, the gains up to 31st January 2018 will be grandfathered. That is, it will only have a prospective effect and not a retrospective effect. And what is to be noted that the securities transactions tax and the short-term capital gains tax will continue to coexist in the same manner. Now, by the first reading of this amendment, what we can realize is that prior to the budget, the LTCG on sale of listed shares and securities was exempt because the companies were paying STT on it. But now, apart from the companies paying STT, the investor also has to bear a tax of 10% under Section 112A. So owing to the fact that many investors were enjoying this tax exemption and the capital market had become buoyant because of the entry of so many new investors, what do you think? Do you think that the levy of both STT and LTCG acts as a disadvantage? Do you think that the capital market will still remain an attractive investment option? And most of all, does it make you wonder why the government came up with such an amendment? Well, when you read the reason behind the amendment, you will realize that yes, the investors were enjoying a tax exemption and yes, the capital market had become buoyant because of the entry of so many new investors. But what comes as a surprise is the statistics. The finance minister in the union budget speech mentioned that the total amount of exempted capital gains arising on sale of listed shares and securities amounted to rupees 3,67,000 crores. I repeat, 3,67,000 crores as per the returns filed for the assessment year 17-18. And most of these gains were accruing to the companies and LLPs. So this created a bias against the manufacturing sector because most of the business surpluses were being invested into the capital markets and not the manufacturing sector. And the returns from such investments were already quite attractive even without the tax exemption. So the government therefore felt a strong need to bring the LTCG on sale of listed shares and securities under the tax net. Now let us understand this better with the help of an example. Let's say a few shares were purchased on 1st January 2015 and they were sold on 20th April 2018 the units were purchased at rupees 100 per unit and sold at rupees 150 per unit. 
and the fair market value as on 31st January 2018 was rupees 130 per unit and the number of units involved in the transaction was 10,000. So in the pre-budget scenario, the calculation is fairly simple. You just have to reduce the cost of acquisition from your uh, sale consideration. So that will result in a total capital gains of 5 lakh rupees. But since it is exempt under section 1038, you would not have any capital gains tax. But in the post-budget scenario, for the uh, purpose of calculation of cost of acquisition, you need to understand that for the securities purchased prior to 1st February 2018, cost of acquisition would be the lower of the sale price and the fair market value as on 31st Jan 2018 and the higher of the actual uh, cost of purchase and the lower of these two. So the higher of uh, the lower of 150 and 130 would be 130 and the higher of 100 and 130 would be 130 again. So our cost of acquisition per unit in the post budget scenario is 130 which will amount to a total cost of acquisition of 13 lakhs. So our capital gains in this case is 2 lakh rupees. And as you all know, section 112A states that it will be taxed at 10% for gains over rupees 1 lakh. So only the additional 1 lakh would be taxed at the rate of 10%, which will result in a capital gains tax of rupees 10,000. This is a major difference between the pre-budget and the post-budget scenario. Now let's leave aside the government's intentions, why the government brought in this amendment, let's leave that aside. If I were to analyze it from an investor's point of view, I would say that historically the exponential growth both in terms of volume and turnover in the capital markets had been without the participation of the retail investors. But now, since the participation of these investors has been increasing year on year, I think the levy of both STT and LTCG acts as a check. An investor, uh, any small investor would think that his short term capital gains is taxed at 15% while the long term capital gains is taxed at 10%. So he wouldn't really see much benefit by holding on to his investment for too long. This may potentially dissuade long term holdings and encourage short term exits thereby resulting in cyclical volatility and deprivation of capital in the long run. So while the investors reallocate their assets and the capital market gets used to these changes, the potential new investor will wonder where to put his next rupee. Moving on to the next major amendment, this is regarding the deemed income arising on sale or purchase of immovable property. This is definitely an incentive for the real estate sector, as you all can see from the topic. So what used to happen was that the sellers of immovable properties, in order to avoid tax on capital gains and on business professions, they used to show lesser sale consideration than what was actually received. In order to curb these practices, the government introduced three new sections in the Income Tax Act 1961. And I'm sure all of you all have heard of these sections or you are aware of these sections. So these sections are section 50C relating to capital gain, section 43CA relating to business profession. Uh, section 50C and 43CA provides that in case the stamp duty value is higher than the actual sale consideration, then the stamp duty value will be deemed to be the entire sale consideration received by the seller of the property. And section 56 went ahead to put the tax liability on the buyer of the property as well by stating that where the difference between the stamp duty value and the actual sale consideration is more than rupees 50,000, then the entire difference would be taxed under the head income from other sources. But later, the government realized that this difference between the stamp duty value and actual sale consideration is genuine in most cases. This is because the apartments or the buildings that are located, situated in the same locality, they are usually assigned the same stamp duty value. 
but their actual market value will vary on so many factors let's say the facing of the building whether it's east facing or west facing or whether the house is located in the ground floor or the top floor or the size of the building the shape of the building etc so in order to provide relief to such buyers and sellers the government has amended these three sections so post the budget section 50c and 43ca provide that where the stamp duty value does not exceed 105% of the actual sale consideration then no adjustment will have to be made for the sale consideration for the purpose of uh, computing his business income or capital gains and section 56 has been amended to replace the difference limit of 50000 with 50000 or 5% of the actual sale consideration whichever is higher again we will understand this with the help of an example let's say mr x sold a flat to mr y at a sale consideration of rupees 40 lakhs and at the time of registration the stamp duty value was 41 lakhs so when we look at the pre budget scenario in case of mr x since the stamp duty value here is higher than the actual sale consideration the stamp duty value which is 41 lakhs would be deemed to be the entire sale consideration received by x and in case of y since the difference between the stamp duty value and the actual sale consideration is 1 lakhs which is more than 50000 the entire difference of 1 lakh would be taxed under the head income from other sources now post the budget when we look at the scenario in case of mr x he would be allowed a variation of 105% of his actual sale consideration so 105% of 40 lakhs would amount to 42 lakhs whereas the actual sale consideration uh, the stamp duty value as on the date of registration is only 41 lakhs so there would have to be no adjustment made the sale consideration uh, to be taken for the purpose of computation would be 40 lakhs itself and in case of mr y he will be allowed a variation of 5% of 40 lakhs which is 2 lakhs and uh, 50000 whichever is higher so the higher of the two is 2 lakhs uh, but the difference in our case here is only rupees 1 lakh so he would not have any income from other sources so this is definitely an incentive for both the buyers and the sellers because it is helping them to do away with so many genuine hardships moving ahead to the next major amendment imagine a situation where an investor can uh, get an exemption from tax on capital gains and at the same time invest his funds in the infrastructural development of the company of the of the country this is exactly what section 54 ec does section 54 ec prior to the budget provided that capital gains on sale of any capital asset would be exempt provided it is invested in specified securities within a period of 6 months from the date of transfer and the lock in period was mentioned as 3 years but post the budget the government has amended this section to provide that ltcg on sale of immovable properties only will be exempt and the lock in period has been extended to 5 years as against the previous 3 years i think this again is locking in a, an investors funds for far too long and it would be a disadvantage to them the fourth and the last amendment that i will be talking about is the concessions for the ifsc uh in january 2017 prime minister narendra modi inaugurated india's first international financial services center which is called as india inx in the gift city like our speakers in the previous session as well mentioned so many offshore uh, offshore uh, ifscs provide very low rates of tax in order to attract mncs to set up their businesses there to provide a level playing field our government has also given various concessions to the ifsc units in the past and to further the same objective it has given two more concessions this time as well so one of them states that the transactions made on bonds derivatives 
global depository receipts and rupee denominated bonds by a non-resident on an IFSC exchange would be exempt from capital gains tax. The next amendment would be that uh, previously the government provided a concessional minimum alternate tax of 9% as against the regular MAT rate of 18.5% for the corporate unit set up in the IFSE. Now, this concessional rate of 9% has been extended to the non-corporate units set up in the IFSE as well by stating that the alternate minimum tax which is applicable to the non-corporate units has been reduced to 9%. This is a definitely a bold move by the government, one that will ensure that it's a financial hub at par with uh, countries like Dubai, Singapore, Hong Kong, etc. So to summarize, if I were to analyze every amendment made in the budget, a few are advantages to the investors, a few are not. But the fact still remains that the government has brought about these amendments because it thinks it is in the best interest of the revenue and in the best interest of the nation. Henry Ford said, if we always keep doing what we've always done, we will always get what we've always got. So if we want our economy to grow, there has to be some change made in the existing system. And we as investors, we as advisors to our investors, can only update and adapt. So if there is one thing that we now need to focus on in two words, it's this. Stay tuned. Thank you. You came out with a lot of examples to make them understand the nuances involved in uh, capital gains. Uh, having said that, uh, of course, uh, there were two, three things which I thought I will uh, bring it to your kind attention. Akshay was mentioning about uh, masala bonds uh, that has been issued. Uh, this is basically the, uh, to help uh, Indian corporates to get funds from abroad. So one of the challenges that was there, which I thought uh, I will just supplement what Akshay said. One of the challenge, uh, if you have to raise uh, funds abroad, is that since the bonds are located in India, situated in India, on transfer of those bonds outside, there was a capital gain which was, a, which was getting attracted here in India. Though, the transfer was between two non-residents. So, let us say uh, masala bonds were, uh, you know, uh, it was there uh, in US or UK and it was traded between two non-residents it would have been subject to tax in India, which they have tried to exempt through this particular uh, amendment, which Akshay was mentioning about. And of course, uh, uh, besides all these things, uh, um, to learn a subject, friends, all of us have to understand, because all of you have been preparing for your examination, when you have to learn a subject, be strong on your basics which is what, in fact, I was also looking at in this pr particular presentation. It seems Brazil, all of us know, is famous for football, right? Yes? Brazil is famous for football. And uh, when Brazil exited from World Cup, uh, you know, the, um, their coach took them back to Brazil and, uh, and then the next day, it seems uh, he asked all of them to come to the field. And when all of them assembled in the field thinking that, you know, they are going to prepare for the next World Cup, I think uh, this gentleman took the football and made all of them and showed all of them and they said, look, guys, this is called football. What he meant was, you know, a Brazil which could not do this, which could not uh, qualify is not because of that you have made some advanced mistakes. It is you erred in fundamental things. So something like that when we are looking at a subject, friends, let us be good at fundamentals first. Let us understand the basics first. Why it is? What is the section talking about? What are the charging sections? What is section 35? Section 45 is all about. What is section 28 is all about? Right? 
this water section 15 is all about this charging section gives us lot of insights when we are looking at uh, understanding or taxability of a particular uh, particular income right well having said that i must uh, really compliment uh, both the speakers for having done a splendid job i think they call for it calls for a good round of applause from all of you and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity Thank you to our session chairman and student speakers for that very insightful and knowledge widening session on the topic of capital gains. It is safe to say that we have all become more knowledgeable people after having witnessed this session. Please give them a very big round of applause. I would now, I would now like to propose the vote of thanks for the session. On behalf of the Bangalore branch of SIRC of ICI, and Sikasa Bangalore, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to CA Sachin Kumar BP, sir, for conducting such an incredible session. Thank you, sir. I would also like to thank our student speakers, Mr. Akshay S. Chipadi and Ms. Shamita C. Harli, for presenting their papers and widening the knowledge of all the attendants present here today. Thank you to the both of you. I now request Mr. Atarva to present a memento as a token of gratitude and respect to the session chairman, CA Sachin Kumar BP. I now request Mr. Atarva to present a memento as a token of appreciation to the student speakers, Mr. Akshay and Ms. Shamita. This concludes the technical session on capital gains. Over to Archana.